Hello again everyone, it's Jim Lynn here. Welcome to episode 20 of Mr Lynn's Workshop. Last month I went to the North of England Woodworking Show at the Great Yorkshire Showground near Harrogate. It was good to be back, I hadn't been there since 2019 and uh, the show was just as good as it ever was. I decided to make some videos of the show but of course you can't cover everything, there's just too much. So I made three videos. The first video was made at the Veritas stand where I met Richard Weil and Ryan Saunders. First of all, here's Richard. My name's Richard Weil. I'm the uh, director of brand management for Veritas Tools in Canada. Yep. So I'm here supporting uh, our retailers in this marketplace. So the Axminster here and Classic Hand Tools over on the other yeah. side of the arena. So, yeah. Yeah, so you, you were saying you've just written a book on sharpening. Can you tell us something about that? Yeah, um, about a year ago we published a book called A Sharpening Handbook um, that's uh, available from uh, woodworking tool retailers around. The classic Hand Tools has some over at, the, at their stand today. Uh, Axminster also sells the book. And really it's a, a handbook which is what do I need to know to be good at sharpening. So it's, it presents a method and a technique that, well, we know that there's many, many ways you can sharpen um, your tools. Um, this is a method, and it is a method that will work. So, you know, there are many other methods that work, but if people are looking to sort of ground what they're doing in a technique that they believe that they can, um, you know, improve the way they're doing things, this will work for them provides enough background information on uh, media, honing guides, um, and sort of other aspects like the, the metal involved. So you don't need to be a metallurgist to understand the difference in tool steels, but it doesn't hurt to have a basic understanding, and that's what we've tried to do in the book, is to uh, give you enough information to make an informed decision about what type of steel you should be putting in your plane pro planes or chisels and that sort of thing. Talk about Hardness is another area that has a dramatic impact on um, the quality of the edge that you can get on your tool, and you know, so we try to present some information on that as well. And there's a few other things added in, like how to sharpen a scraper, and also basic intro on carving tool sharpening as well. So try to provide sort of an all-arounder. Um, yeah, so so it's something for every everything that needs sharpening. Yeah, that's the idea, and. and at the beginning, I spend time talking about what sharp is and trying to understand um, what an edge looks like. And once you have an understanding of what sharp looks like and feels like and how to get it, you can sharpen anything. You could pick up, you know, a set of shears in the garden and look at it. It's like there's where the there's where the bevel is. That's what I need to sharpen. I can sharpen it. You know, whether I've got a small diamond or a rod or ceramic or anything like that, sharpen it up and about your way without anybody having to show you how to sharpen that particular tool. Yeah, like, so it doesn't matter what kind of metal you're sharpening, the, the techniques will work for them all? The technique will work. It's really how far you can go. You know, like this over here is a, a 10,000 grit stone. Softer, lower quality tool steels aren't going to benefit from a stone that fine. You're probably going to want to stop at, you know, more like a four or 5,000 range, which would be where you would stop at for even the finest of kitchen knives, um, versus harder, higher quality steels, um, you know, will benefit from some of the finest grains there are, you know, like the Japanese chisels, which are, you know, Rockwell 64, 65, are really hard, take a really fine edge. Some people sharpen those up to a 30 thou stone, which is, you know, a little crazy, but, uh, you know, that's straight razor, straight razor material. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, Veritas tools, what, what steels do you use mainly for the blades, like for the plain blades and the chisels? Yeah, our um, main tool steel is PMV11, which is PM stands for powdered metal, um, which is our unique proprietary formulation of um, alloy, which is uh, designed specifically for this purpose. And, you know, traditionally we would have seen A2 and O1 steels as, as primary options for uh, plain irons and chisels, um, PMV11 sort of takes the best of all worlds and tries to combine them. Um, the net result is 
takes less time to sharpen and it the edge is more durable, it lasts longer. So less time sharpening, more time woodworking. It's a few pounds more on a tool at the outset, but you're going to be thankful for, for the life of the tool. We see an awful lot of people replacing you know, blades that they bought 10 years ago before PMB 11 came along, or because you know, they were in A2 at the time and wanted to stick with that, lot, sell a lot of replacement blades for people looking to upgrade both our products as well as you know, vintage Stanleys and those sort of things. We make those blades to provide sort of a modern technology blade in a vintage a traditional tool. Thank you, Richard. Ryan Saunders was also at the Veritas stand and he was demonstrating the use of the Veritas sharpening system, which is the system I use. And he was using it to sharpen the blade from a Veritas low angle jointer. Here's Ryan. This is the whole uh, Mark II Deluxe honing uh, guide setup that we've got here. And so you've got a few different options. You've got the uh, regular plain blade clamp here. So this can clamp wide blades. Um, anything too narrow though, and it's going to get kind of difficult to evenly clamp down on that. So we offer the side clamping option as well. That allows you to clamp much smaller chisels, much more consistently basically. Um, so that's an option for your narrow blades. And then if you're cambering any irons as well, we also have the cambered roller that you can add on to either of these for cambering your plain irons. Um, but for just for now, we're going to use the regular plain blade clamping guide with the straight roller. Um, so we've got the uh, roller here. It also can add a secondary bevel on a, a cam there, and we're, we're just going to have it set to zero. We've got the blade already ground at 25 degrees. It has been honed, but it's blunt at the moment. To get us started there, we've got the angle setting jig, and we're on stop two, as you can see here, on stop two on the guide. So we use the yellow um, readings here, and we're going to hone at 30 degrees. So we can pop the setting jig onto the holder and this blade happens to be two and a quarter inches wide so we'll just set it at that mark and lock it on and we're already set for the 30 degrees so now we can pop the blade in and we make sure that blade is up against the stop here and up against the stop on the end and that ensures that it's both square and out at the correct projection so once that's clamped into there lightly, just pinched up, I actually want to sight down across the blade and I want to see if there's an even amount of light coming through. So looking above the blade and below the blade just to make sure this is clamping down evenly. If it was skewed one way or the other, the blade would have a tendency to shift in the guide. So we make sure that's nice and, nice and even. And then with it in there evenly, I can then tighten them both up and lock that in place. Remove the setting jig and I'm now set for my 30 degree honing angle. So really kind of straightforward. And the, the real key to this system, there are obviously quicker ways to get to that point, but I have the option of very quickly setting different angles or swapping out for a narrow chisel or the cambered roller. So it, this isn't really about setting and honing one blade. It's about having a range of options. That's what this really excels at. So we've got that locked in. Um, so for the stones here, I've got really simple setup. We've got a 1,000 grit water stone and a 10,000 grit water stone. Um, you can often find people will be using an intermediary stone as well, like a, a 3 or a 6,000. And really that's only necessary for particularly hard steels like your Japanese steel blades or something like that, where they are really, really hard and they have a hard time polishing at high grit. So you need to work up the grits to, to be able to do that. Um, so just a 1 and a 3,000 is, is plenty. So we've got that there, ready to go, got them wet. And this is the same process if this, was, if this blade was uh, fresh out of the box today. Um, I have already sharpened up one today that was fresh out of the box and I did exactly the same setup. So um, this is exactly what you need to do um, with a new blade or one that is, as you can see, has already been used and it's got a, a, a slightly worn secondary bevel there. And not an awful lot, so you'll see this, this polished area will creep up the bevel a little bit. So we'll go to the 1000 grit stone and we want even pressure across the stone on the blade. We don't want to put all our pressure on one side or the other, otherwise the bevel will be skewed. Um, the benefit of having this wide roller as well is that it sits nice and stable. There's not any rocking here. So I can put my thumbs either top or bottom, whatever's comfortable, even pressure. 
and we want to press as we pull the blade back and release our pressure as we move forward. Having said that, you don't want to lift the, the blade up. If you lift the blade up as you move forward, there's a tendency to put it down too early and then gouge into the stone. So just pressure and release, pressure and release. And I'd like to take a couple of passes where I'm just being careful like that in case there's any serrations in the blade, it just knocks them off to start with. And then once I've done that, I can increase the speed. And I'll start by taking a dozen, maybe a few more strokes. And once I've done that, I'll stop, wipe the blade off and have a quick look. And I want to see what effect that's had on the blade. Now, what I'm really looking for is just that I'm reaching corner to corner. And the best way to tell how that's, how, you know, how I'm progressing with that is not visual and it's just feeling for a burr on the back of the blade. Now, right now, I can feel a very slight burr on this corner, but there's nothing the rest of the way. So I've not polished this edge or, or honed it right to the tip, so I'm not done. So I'll go back to the stones and carry on. Now, had this been a new blade and I was establishing this bevel to start with, about 15, 20 strokes is all you need. Um, but because it's already been honed, I've got to obviously work past whatever has been done before um, to get that burr all the way across. Now, I can't feel anything, so I'm still, still gonna keep going on this grip. So hopefully that will, there we go. So I can feel a burr from that corner and it's fainter, but there is a burr all the way to that edge. So that is all I'm looking for at this point. I don't care how far up this bevel it's going right yet, as long as it's not so far that it's taken me a long time. And all I'm concerned with is that I'm removing material all the way to the tip. And the best way to tell that is by looking for the burr. So I've got that there, and that means I'm done on this stone. So we can just wipe the wheel, make sure there's no grit left on that. And we can go to our fine stone. As I say, this is a, one, uh, a 10,000 grit, sorry, water stone, and exactly the same process. Even pressure, a couple of careful strokes to start with, and then with a bit of speed. Go as slow as you need, though. There's no need to rush. When you do this, as much as I have done this, you can get a bit more speed going, and it's a bit more comfortable, but there's no need to rush. And again, I do sort of a dozen or 20 passes there. And at this point, what I'm concerned with now is I'm looking at this secondary bevel and I want to look at the scratch pattern. Now, I should have hopefully polished out some of the 1000 grit um, scratches and they should be around the same sort of size as I'd expect from a 10,000. So I'm looking at that polished edge and I'm looking for some coarse lines. If I see a coarse scratch in that, it's because there's a bit of a scratch from the 1000 that's still there and I need to keep going. So I'm just gonna hold this up to the light and I'll look at that edge and get a glint of light through it and move it back and forth, see what I can see. And it looks actually really good. So I don't think I need to go any further. Just to check the edges looking okay, that's fine. The other thing to bear in mind with sharpness is that you can't see a sharp edge in that a dull edge presents itself by way of a slight white glistening edge right at the tip and that's because any flat or any rounded portion of that bevel the light is going to hit that and reflect back at you so when that's gone that means you're sharp so I can't see that and I can't see any coarse scratches that are going to be a problem one other thing you can do is you can take the blade and just run it across your nail very carefully of course and by doing that you'll feel any kind of little catches and if it doesn't catch you haven't got any coarse scratches that are making it to the edge. If it does, you might not even be able to see it, but if it catches, there is a serration in that edge and you'll notice it when you get to the uh, plane in the timber. So I'm happy with that, we're good to go. So that means I'm done with the guide. So I can take this out of the guide, be careful not to pull it out the wrong way. You wanna make sure the blade doesn't, uh, the tip of the blade doesn't contact anything now. And I'm just gonna quickly remove anything that's left of a burr. It's very possible that it actually removed in polishing this edge anyway but just to make sure, we'll do a couple of passes on the final polishing stone. For me, that was the 10,000 grit here. And then remove any water that's left. 
one thing I should say, this is the Veritas PMV11 blade, um, and P uh, all of uh, Veritas blades are lapped at the, uh, at the factory. So this is more than flat enough. Now, it's not polished, but it is pretty close. Um, really, anything above 1,000 grit is fine, but you do not, do not want to put this on anything below 1,000 grit. You're going to have adverse effects from that. Really, all you need to do is touch from the factory, is touch this to your finest polishing stone. And over time, by doing that, this will polish the back. But as it is, it's flat and polished enough. So just a quick swipe like that, and that's all you need. So this is now ready to go back in the tool. All I've got to do at this point is... I like to just wipe all the blades down after sharpening with water stones with an oily rag just to make sure there's nothing, uh, nothing that's going to surprise me next time I take the tool apart. So that's that. We've already got the jack body here ready to go. So we'll get this placed inside. And the lever cap. And now we've got the task of setting the plane up. Now, I like to use a little wooden shim. I've just got a little piece of cherry here. And first of all, I'm going to sight down the um, sight down the sole of the plane. And I'm looking for, as I advance the blade, I'm looking for a black line across here. Now, I won't be able to show you this. It's not something you can easily show over, over the camera. But as I'm sighting down the sole in this direction, I can see a, a tiny black line, and that is the shadow created by the blade sticking out. Now, that's already there, so I actually need to back this up a touch. So I'm going to retract the blade until I see either, in an ideal world, all of the blade retract all at the same time, or more realistically, the blade will be slightly skewed, and I can see the blade is sticking out here, and it's already starting to vanish on this side. So that means I've got a heavy cut on this side. So what I'll do is I'll take the adjuster here and I'll push it to the heavy side just very slightly. I think I went a bit far there, but we'll have a look. And now I can advance the blade again and see, see what I did. And as the blade starts to stick out, it actually looks really nice and even. So now I've got that visually parallel, I can take my shim and I can take a tiny little shaving on that side and a tiny little shaving on that side. And as much as feeling the shaving, I'm, I'm really not looking at the shavings. You can't tell visually these shavings, how thick they are. So as much as feeling it, if we weren't in a noisy environment like the show today, I would be listening for the sound. And you can hear the, the tick sort of sound of the, of the piece of wood coming past. So I'm actually just going to retract the blade a little bit. And then hopefully I can't feel anything. No, no cut. So I'll just advance the blade a little bit. Try again. No cut. And I'm probably advancing this, I mean, a, a sixteenth of a turn or something of in, in that nature. It's a small amount. Just trying to get that initial cut. I think I backed it off a little bit too far to start with, so. There we go. So, at this point, I'm getting just a tiny little cut, and hopefully you can see these really wispy little shavings. And that's on this side. So that's fine. Now what I need to do is try this side and hopefully it will match. I'm getting the shavings on this side as well. And let's have a, let's have a look at what's coming out of the mouth, see if you can see. The shavings on that side and the shavings on that side. And I don't know what they look like, but they feel to the, the drag resistance on the little stick of wood, they feel very similar. So I'm happy that that is evenly set. I've got the same protrusion of blade on this side as I do this side. And because I've sharpened the blade straight across, I know that that means it must be parallel. So I'm done with setting. Now all I have to worry about is the blade in and out, which I can do with the adjustment back here. So we've got a piece of wood here. This has previously been scraped. So it's pretty, pretty flat, but it's not glass smooth. So uh, the last thing I'll do is just close up the mouth of the tool again. So we can drop the, the adjustable mouth on here, right up close to the blade. And on the Veritas plane, we've got a little stop bolt here that we can use. And if I turn it over, you can see as I wind the stop out, it opens up the mouth. As I wind it back in, it can close the mouth up again. And that allows me to set a stop position so that I don't drop the mouth of the um, plane into the blade. 
So I set that for my finest, my finest mouth opening like that. And now I can very quickly go to a coarse opening or a fine one without risk of uh, hitting the blade. So keeping it on the fine setting, we'll see what kind of cut we're getting here. And so, as I say, this isn't flat, so I'm gonna get a little bit of a hit and miss shaving to start with. But the thickness of shaving seems okay. So I'm just gonna keep going. Okay, it's taken on the high spots off and now it's kind of bottomed out a bit. So just gonna advance the blade a tiny little bit. And you know, if we're if we're here to get work done, then I'm I'm wasting time at this point. These shavings are are too thin for for practical purposes. You know, I could get just as good a finish off the wood with a thicker shaving. But as we often do at shows, if we're here to ogle over the shavings, then we can go a little bit further. So I'm going to retract the blade a little bit and then bring it back into the advanced position. And I'm just going to very slightly adjust it with every pass until it just starts to take a cut. And again, I'll start with these wispy little bits. There's a high spot on one side there. And then we'll advance a little bit more. Tiny, tiny amounts. Until this is sufficiently flattened, the piece of wood such that it can take a, a wider shaving. Ah, I just, I think I knocked that a bit far then. Try that again. There we go. So these are those really, really, really thin shavings. And the best way to demonstrate that Take one of the guides for the show today. There we go. But, like I say, that's not the product. This is. And can't show you that on camera, but that's a, a pretty good surface. Yeah, get a, a good sheen off that. Yeah, I don't know if you catch that in the light. Also, is a good demonstration of how how much Sharpie penetrates into wood. You can still see the, the writing there. Fantastic, right? Fantastic. I love that swishing sound. Yeah. Probably not come out on the, on the sound of the background noise, but yeah. hopefully it's close enough. And this is one of the things about the sounds in the workshop. It's, it's just as important to hear or to pay attention to what you can hear as it is to what you can see and what you can feel. Because the sound of that, that swooshing sound, the pitch of that will change dependent on the depth of cut I take. If I try and take a really harsh, heavy cut, it's going to through rather than the that you get with a nice, clean, slicing cut. That's excellent, Ryan. Thank you very much. No problem. So Thanks very much. A, a blunt blade to fine shavings. Hopefully. Well <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of Mr. Lynn's Workshop. Next time, we'll be talking to Shane and Jackie Skelton of Skelton Saws. But for the meantime, thank you for watching, everyone, and I'll see you next time on Mr. Lynn's Workshop.